Welcome to Chatham House. I'm uh, Robin Niblett, Director of the Institute, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning. This is a little earlier than one of our usual uh, uh, members' meetings, um, but we really want to take advantage uh, of the opportunity of the visit by uh, Mexican Foreign Minister Jose Antonio Meade to London and to try to uh, take advantage of his being here to follow up um, on the situation both in Mexico and Mexico's position in the world, given the fact that we had the great honor and pleasure of hosting uh, his president, Enrique Peña Nieto, here in June of last year. Um, being able to keep that connectivity going, we're also undertaking some aspects of research with uh, sister Mexican institutes as well. Um, and so to be able to uh, hear a little bit his thoughts about what's taking place in Mexico, uh, and also uh, Mexico's foreign policy uh, seemed like too good an opportunity to miss. Um, I did want to say though quickly um, to the Foreign Secretary that it's great to have him here because I think he's somebody who is going to be able to talk to the story of Mexico um, as we think about it today because this is a Mexico that is really putting its foot down on the accelerator of structural reform and this was very much the theme of the President's speech when he was here and a lot of the media interest an external interest in what is taking place in Mexico. But I think at the same time, it'd be fair to say we are very much in a G20 world, uh, and one in which uh, mid-sized countries like the UK or Mexico um, uh, are playing an increasingly important role on international affairs issues as well, and trying to pick and select the areas where they can make a difference. And so uh, it'll be very interesting to hear his remarks. Uh, the Foreign Secretary is well-placed to be able to uh, undertake this kind of a discussion because actually he was trained as an economist and in law at the beginning. I should call him Dr. Mead, I think, uh, in that sense, uh, with a, a Yale PhD, but has also worked uh, therefore on the economic side, the legal side in government, um, but most recently also as a Minister for Finance. He's worked on the energy side, so he brings a very broad range of experiences uh, to his current position. Um, Jose Antonio. Pleasure to welcome you to Chatham House. We look forward to your remarks and uh, to engaging in conversation. <coughs> welcome to Chatham House. Well, thank you, and, and good morning. It's a real pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you, Robin, for your kind presentation. You said that I was trained as an economist. One of those that trained me was Elena Ginez, who was here. He taught me advanced micro. So if I make any mistakes on that topic, you can refer to Alain at the end, at the end of the conference. <coughs> Uh, foreign policy is, is all about dialogue. When dialogue is successful, it can sometimes be translated into a legal framework. And if the legal framework is well designed, it would be useful in supporting action, be it a free trade agreement, be it an agreement to foster mobilization of labor or, or capital, be it a, an agreement to cooperate on judicial affairs, but in a way, at the end, you basically have, when you're designing your foreign policy, to decide what it is that you want to talk about and who it is that you, talk, that you want to talk about it with. And in a way, you cannot divorce that question from what is going on internally, what you want to do with an administration, what is relevant about the country from which you are designing your foreign policy with. So if you look at what the country is talking about and who the country is talking about with, you will be able to understand a lot about what is going on within that specific country. Mexico, for structural reason, has to be part of the global dialogue on many elements. <clears throat> it's very hard to talk about migration without having Mexico in the table. It's very hard uh, to talk about the challenges of organized crime if Mexico is not present. It's very hard to talk about climate change because of Mexico's biodiversity, because of the fact that Mexico is being affected if we are not part of that conversation. Hopefully, it will be very hard to talk about soccer if Mexico <laughs> is also not uh, present. In the last years, <coughs> President Peña Nieto has wanted the conversation in Mexico to be about constructing a Mexico that's at peace, a Mexico that is generating conditions for inclusiveness, a Mexico that has a capacity to offer a education of quality to its citizens, and Mexico that has the capacity to generate prosperity in the short, medium, and long run, and the Mexico that becomes a more relevant global player. Since we last met here, when the president was here, he talked about his reform agenda, he talked about his pillars, he talked about the challenges of making democracy work. 
Since that time, we have gotten more than 10 constitutional reforms approved, which is relevant if you take into consideration that a constitutional amendment requires two-thirds of Congress and half of local legislatures. And we have had also 95 initiatives approved at a secondary level, which requires a simple majority. But all in all, the structural transformation taking place in Mexico from a legal perspective it's quite impressive in both the scale and the scope of the issues that Mexico has tackled. Uh, since we last met, we have done energy reform, telecommunications reform. We included the best practices of the OECD at a constitutional level in terms of antitrust. We did relevant and meaningful fiscal reform, which made our, <coughs> our fiscal policies more progressive and that will allow government to have better capacity to provide uh, public goods. We did uh, electoral and political reform, transparency reform. So there are very few structural elements of the Mexican reality that had not been transformed from the perspective of its legal architecture in the last 18 months. So one of the things that Mexico talks about now is how to take advantage of, of those policy reforms and how those reforms change the dialogue that we have in different places. Coming back again uh, to, to dialogue and the design of foreign policy, one has to take into consideration not just the structural elements of the country, the size of its population, its geographic location, uh, the, the type of issues, problems, challenges uh, that it has, but one has to take into consideration also where that country belongs to. And there are many elements, where, where many relevant belongings that a country has to consider for deciding what to talk about and who to talk about it with. One of them, a very important one, one that conditions your dialogue has to do with geography. And in the case of Mexico's foreign policy, one of the relevant issues is designing what our geographical belongings are and how we can take advantage of that geographical belonging. A second arena has to do with our economic belongings. Not all of our relationships are conditioned by our geography. So from an economic perspective, Robin mentioned it at, at the beginning, one of our most important economic belongings is the G20. So that is also something that we need to take into consideration when looking at Mexico's foreign policy. And another area of belonging that goes beyond economics and that goes beyond geography has to do with the stance and the issues that we defend multilaterally. In some of those cases, we are natural partners with some countries where we have not really strong economic ties and not really strong uh, geographical presence or relationship. But nevertheless, we are good dialogue partners because we believe or we are trying to achieve or we face similar uh, problems. So with that in view, <coughs> who is Mexico talking to geographically and what are we talking about? Mexico is a Caribbean uh, country. We share with 24 other countries uh, the blue seas and the white sands of the Caribbean. And with the Caribbean, we have a similar set of challenges, most notably climate change and the opportunity to take advantage and to preserve the Caribbean Sea as, as, a, as a, an endowment that allows the Caribbean region to prosper and to thrive. And we have a similar uh, opportunities. We have an opportunity to develop a policy around sustainable tourism. We trade with the Caribbean, about $3.3 billion per year. But we are significant to some of our Caribbean trading partners. For example, the Dominican Republic trades with Mexico every year, the equivalent of 2% of their GDP. So within the Caribbean, Mexico talks about trade. We talk about tourism, we talk about climate change, uh, we talk about how to build resilience to disasters and how to manage these disasters better. So that is a prominent role and that is one of the, pro the things that Mexico is capable to talk about taking into consideration that specific geographical belonging. Mexico is also Central America. We are Central American by ethnicity, we are Central America by proximity, we share with Central America having been a home to the Mayan and to the Olmecs, home to maize and to Chile. <coughs> we talk <coughs> with Central America about integration. And we talk with Central America about how to construct a 
a peaceful region, how to construct an inclusive region, and how to construct a prosperous region. Because we recognize that for Mexico to become an inclusive, prosperous, and at peace region, especially in the southern part of Mexico, these conditions have to be there in Central America as well. The good news is that there is more and more content to the relationship between Mexico and Central America. Central America is housed to about 50 million people, which is a little bit less than Mexico's population, and they have been doing well for the past decade. You have countries like Panama that are growing at double digit, and they have been growing at double digit for about a decade. Uh, countries like Costa Rica that have been also exhibiting a high amount of growth. But in general, for the first time in many, many years, all of the Central American countries are growing. They're all strengthening their own institutions. So that means that today we trade with Central America more than we trade with Spain. We actually trade with Central America more than we trade with the UK, but we're trying to do something about that and get the UK number up. But that means that Mexico talks about security, which is a challenge that we have in common. We talk about inclusiveness because we are still a very unequal region. And we talk and we do things that can foster prosperity in the region. Behind Mexico's discourse that we should be more integrated with Central America, we are actually doing something about it. We have created a fund that can actually support infrastructure projects in the region that are helpful for Central America to become better integrated with Mexico. We are, of course, also Latin America. It is when one asks Mexico or a Mexican to define itself in terms of, of our belongings, most people would define themselves as Latin America. And defining oneself as Latin America means that we believe that Neruda, Garcia Marquez, Vargas Llosa, and Octavio Paz are really Latin American and not just Peruvian, Chilean, Colombian, uh, or, or Mexican. We are part of almost all of the alphabet of integration within the Latin American community. There are many uh, regional integration mechanisms to which Mexico is a party to. We trade uh, with South America about $30 billion a year we invest more in Brazil than China does, and we are a trading partner to Brazil that is amongst the top five trading partners to Brazil. So the only rivalry between Mexico and Brazil is in soccer. Of course, we're going to beat them next week, and that will create rivalries of a different level. But few countries have an, an economic relationship that is as vibrant and as dynamic as Mexico and Brazil has even though this is not widely uh, recognized. Mexico is one of the largest investors in South America. We have invested in the last decade around $85 billion in the region. Uh, we have worked with South American regional integration. The best platform through which we have achieved it is, of course, the Pacific Alliance. We have created a common market of more than 200 million people. We're the $2 trillion GDP economy. It's about 35% of Latin American's GDP, more than half of its exports, and 70% of its manufactured exports. And it is a mechanism that has generated a lot of interest. We have more than 32 observers. And what we're trying to do with the Pacific Alliance is to further integration inside of its members, but also to identify issues that the members can work with with the observers so at the end of, of every meeting, of every cycle, you not only have the Pacific Alliance countries better integrated amongst themselves, but that you have the Pacific Alliance better integrated with the observers uh, through that process. Of course, we are part of the Pacific Rim. It is one of the oldest trading routes in the world. You had Japanese presence in Acapulco more than 400 years ago. And that route of trade was very well established, which probably explains why today our second largest trading partner as a region is Asia Pacific, with whom we trade more than $120 billion every year. We are part of the TPP negotiation, and we are working to strengthen our relationships with both China and Japan. Japan today being our main trading partner in Latin America, the main investor from Asia in Latin America, and China being an integral part of Mexico's uh, value chain. I mentioned at the beginning, going beyond geography, Mexico is also a member of the G20. 
And as such, from a foreign policy perspective, it makes a lot of sense for Mexico to review the type of legal framework and the type of relationship that we have with each one of the G20 members. With some, we have a very long-standing and important relationship like the U.S. With some, we have a relationship that is very underdeveloped, as was the case with Turkey and uh, Indonesia. In the case of the U.K., of course, a G20 country, the first one to recognize independent Mexico, which share a lot of common values, the democracy, human rights, rule of law, international cooperation, we have a very high degree of coincidences and therefore we collaborate well in the multilateral scene. We, made, we, we challenged ourselves in 2010 to double our trade by 2015, which is a target that we are going uh, to achieve. Of course, we work a lot with Europe uh, as well. Uh, we trade with Europe about $70 billion. We open up opportunities for Europe in Mexico through the possibility of Europe to invest in Mexico's infrastructure. Mexico just announced a very ambitious and large national infrastructure pl plan that Mexico will require probably investments to the tune of about 350 billion, uh, billion pounds from everything uh, from transportation through energy, water, health, uh, urban tourism. Our most important relationship after having said all of that is still with North America. With North America, we trade $2 million every minute amongst the, the, the three countries. With the U.S., our border is transited every day by more than 1 million uh, people. And behind that trade and behind those crossings, we have been able to construct a shared prosperity. Mexico buys more from the U.S. than uh, China and Japan combined. We might more from the U.S., we have four times more from the U.S. than Brazil does. We buy more from the U.S. than the U.K., France, Germany, Italy, and Spain combined. And last year, we invested more in the U.S. than the U.K. did. And that shows, I think, the importance of Mexico for the North American region and the importance and the scope of the North American integration. There are, as, as Robin said, and I will uh, close with this, uh, a couple of other uh, belongings and a couple of other spaces of dialogue that we want to create. If you look at the G20, there are two sets of countries that are very well defined. The G7, formerly the G8, and the BRIC uh, countries. So what happens at a G20 meeting is you get the G7 in one part of the room, you get the BRICs in the other part of the room, and the rest of the room is just watching. So if for no other reason, so that we have somebody to talk to while we wait, <laughs> it makes a lot of sense to get the rest of the G20 countries together to talk. But if you look as, as to who's left, you have countries like Indonesia, like Korea, like Turkey, and, and Mexico and Australia. And it turns out that it is an interesting grouping of countries. We are large. We are all big democracies. We are all relatively open to trade. We all have similar interests. We all have regional importance. We, we wish we had global importance, but at the very least we have regional importance. And if you take all of us together as a grouping, it turns out that we share similar values in the multilateral agenda, roughly. So it turns out that these countries have a lot to talk about within that forum beyond just the fact that Jim O'Neill bunches up, up together in, a, in, a, in an acronym. So constructing an additional space of dialogue uh, through, through the, these MICTA countries also makes a lot of sense for Mexico because, again, beyond uh, geography and beyond economic ties, these are countries that face similar challenges to the ones that Mexico does. And just, uh, to end with an example from the multilateral agenda, we have and we should have a more economic and vibrant relationship with Africa. We have African roots within Mexico. Eight of the 20 countries that are growing more in the world today are with Africa. And we have not yet developed the legal infrastructure. We have not yet developed the practice of dialogue within the economic framework or with very good partners with Africa in terms of, of designing, debating, and, and shaping the post-2015 development agenda, amongst many others. 
So with Africa, we share common challenges and, and we push forward in many of the same issues. So I think I managed to go around the world in a little bit less than 80 minutes. So, it's, uh, so thank you. Good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.